Great. Let's kick off. Welcome everyone um, to this side session of the GDDF uh, conference, the uh, strategies for addressing mis and disinformation in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, we uh, have a great uh, group of colleagues today here to discuss um, and share our experiences in Slovakia, Poland, Ukraine, and beyond um, as they relate to helping us all understand this topic of, of misinformation, helping us build trust um, and uh, literacy for civil society for authentic information and international development programs. Um, we all uh, are experiencing this social media uh, mis disinformation um, and how it's coming towards us. And we all understand how difficult it is to spot disinformation um, at a time that is probably the most critical uh, in the world. Uh, we will have an hour um, to have this uh, hopefully very lively discussion. Um, I encourage you to please use the chat uh, to put in your comments and questions. Um, we um, will... Um, we will be um, having a question answer type of discussion in this format and then have an opportunity to open up for questions and answers at the end. Um, so with that, I will kick off um, by, by handing over to our colleagues, uh, Tomasz Krishak, uh, Maria Marko Mak Makowska, Anna Sienitska, oh, uh, apologies, Anna, and uh, myself, Elizabeth Villarruel, uh, who are here to share our experiences um, working with MISTIS and malinformation in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, over to you, Tomasz. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for asking me to participate and come to share our uh, experience with uh, what disinformation uh, campaigns we had uh, in Slovakia over the past few months. And I would begin with explaining uh, how difficult or different was the situation here in Slovakia in the past few months, because as well as the rest of the world, we were just uh, coming out of the last COVID wave when uh, in uh, February 2022, the invasion of Russia to Ukraine started and it took us all by surprise. And even though uh, the conflict itself was raging in Ukraine for the past eight years, I would say that most of the public was successfully living in a uh, different parallel reality where many people didn't really have the grasp of uh, the reality of the war and the conflict that was taking place there, even though we are uh, the neighboring country of Ukraine. So uh, what happened uh, in February was that uh, this invasion came by surprise, even for the actors who are pro-Russian and are well settled in our infosphere. And we saw that for a few days, they were really uh, shocked and they were not able to actually create their own narratives that would help them to navigate the public in, the, in a way they wanted. So we had like a few day gap where we were capable of making sure that people in Slovakia were finally better in understanding the context of the conflict that was taking place there. And that actually helped uh, uh, Slovaks to, uh, to find out why is it legitimate to be on the side of Ukraine, why is it legitimate to help refugees and this was taking for a few days and unfortunately later on the forces that are known to spread this information and pro-Russian propaganda in the region uh, started to uh, use and test new narratives. Uh, this phase was taking less than a week and after that, they have uh, evaluated what works best in our context, and they start to reproduce that content and uh, show it to a great amount of public. Uh, by the time, uh, I would say that the same structure of actors who were misusing the crisis of COVID-19 started to misuse the crisis of war. And at the time, uh, we already saw, for instance, political actors like extremists or, 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 or populists who were, for instance, coming to the borders and they were trying to create a scandal that it's not the Ukrainian mothers and children who are coming to, over to Slovakia, but it was uh, uh, different uh, people, people from uh, 
uh, Middle East or, or, or Africa. So they were trying to actually uh, make people in Slovakia think that, oh, this is another migration crisis. It's not uh, something that is connected to the war, to the conflict that is taking place in Ukraine. Uh, later on, uh, this was uh, very uh, effect effectively debunked by Slovak police, who they had like a Facebook channel that is disseminating debunks of various disinformation, even during the time of COVID, but also now during the time of war. And they have managed to show like how important it is to do a very strong and very understandable strategic communication. And they managed to uh, maintain the morale of Slovaks who are now still willing to help Ukrainians because they saw or they overlooked the, uh, the play that was played by these manipulative actors. And this actually brings me to the important notice that what really worked here in Slovakia in the time and what still, still really works as a solution is the whole of society approach where we actually don't really uh, debunk or inform the public separately, but the NGO sector, the state sector and private sector have created a sort of a loose union uh, or uh, of, of, of a network of actors who are contributing with each other and working with each other to actually uh, be better at communicating uh, with the public uh, on daily basis. And for instance, when we have like NGOs that are uh, on the borders helping the refugees, they make sure that they share the information they got from the field with televisions, with politicians, even with the police. And therefore all that intel is then used in a way of strategic communication. So if, if, if that channel of communication and cooperation wouldn't be there, uh, the actors who are successful in communication wouldn't then be able to do as much outputs as needed and to be very, um, effective and actual and uh, very fast in disseminating information and processing it, it's crucial in times like these when we are facing a like, very fluid crisis and the situation itself is changing at a high pace. And of course, the, the role of private sector and especially the role of uh, companies like uh, Gerolata, the one where I uh, work, uh, is that we bring all of the actors I mentioned situational awareness. So even though the situation here is fluidly changing and every day brings us new challenges, we are capable of monitoring enough of the infosphere so it is possible for us to see the trends before they actually uh, happen to have a major impact on society. And all of these things contribute to uh, well, the whole society approach I just, I just mentioned. Thank you, Tomas. Um, we will dive in further uh, to um, some of the strategies that Tomas mentioned and also the whole of community approach uh, shortly. But first, uh, over to you, Maria. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Makovsk. I'm a training education manager in TechSoup. And I'm here, I'll be talking on behalf of Anna Shinska because I see she has some connection, connectivity issues. Anna is a vice president of TechSoup. And TechSoup is a, a global organization supporting civil society actors uh, through technology. Um, and we are here uh, to share our experiences in uh, yeah, strengthening civil society in the region through media literacy um, initiatives. And uh, like, Thomas already shared a lot uh, of uh, inputs on the, how the situation is evolving in Slovakia. I myself, I'm based in Poland, uh, so we are really like close, um, like TechSoup is a global or European scale of our activities, but also as a Polish citizen, I'm really close to different um, challenges that are happening around us. Um, and I would like, adding to what Thomas said, I wanted just to a little bit map the background, right? That, um, since the beginning of the of the war in Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Russia uh, in Ukraine, we have like 4.0 million refugees have fled Ukraine, right? It's a, like the highest number of refugees that uh, Europeans have ever faced. Uh, and like big amount of those people are in Poland. That really, of course, that affected um, that as Polish society, we need to react really like immediately, like to, to all those people who, who, who crossed the border and uh, yet to provide them support. And it was really like, um, 
I will talk about the disinformation context in a second, but just this, this facts are important that with the right millions of Ukrainians, our state was not ready to support them just like this, like day after day, but it was really citizens who reacted and built like ad hoc informal system of help. Uh, so we really, as, as a Polish society, we, I think that we experienced something super unique that of such an amount of people mobilized to help others. And this is like one element, but on the other hand, also what we've observed since last month is that like the spread of Russian disinformation has increased significantly. That, um, that this information war is just going simultaneously and it's not only across like between Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine and Russia, but of course the whole Europe. And also just, I feel that as, a, as Poland, we are really in the middle of it. Um, so that's why like it shows how this, those like disinformation plus this need to react to help people shows how important civil society is and what is the like what is the, why the role is so important to be a player in this disinformation war and also to to really build trust that we can we can be stay resilient and to help to each other not only to refugees but also help to each other as as uh, Thomas said that this um, exchange of information is very important and this is the context like where we are in. Uh, right now, um, which may, like, which shows that it's really kind of a very I would, sensitive moment that people are really vulnerable. It's not only that refugees are vulnerable, but also civil societies are vulnerable because we are vulnerable to disinformation, we are vulnerable to polarization, to tensions, that this war is really around, it's just by the corner. And we are, that's why we have to think about what reactions, what strategies can support civil society, not only in Poland, but in, in, uh, in the region, in Central Eastern Europe, to react in a smart way and just not to be, um, not, not to be influenced, that, that the impact of the, of the information can be uh, lowered. And I will pause here. I'm not sure if Anna is back. <laughs> I don't see her. Oh, no, here it is. Anna, are you here? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes, we will come back to Anna shortly. Sure. Um, so real quick, I will introduce myself as well, Elizabeth Villarroel, I'm with Deloitte. Um, uh, I'm going to be the, a moderator, but also a participant bringing in some of the experiences of um, using um, MISTIS uh, social sensing um, from the analytical perspective um, in uh, Ukraine in particular. Um, where we, where I most recently uh, was able to use um, some of these capabilities. So looking at uh, all sides of, of the strategies that can be used, uh, our colleagues uh, from TechSoup and Gerulata are going to talk about the more grassroots uh, as well as a community-based um, strategies that are necessary for all of us uh, to be very aware of in order to combat this very difficult topic of, of misinformation. Um, so Anna, I see that you're there. I will hand it over to you for a quick intro from your side. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry, I have a, a internet failure. Apologies. Um, my name is Anna Sienitska and I am uh, with TechSoup uh, leading uh, our great team based in Warsaw. And in the recent uh, couple of years, we've been uh, implementing quite a lot of uh, programs which were focused on civil society and countering disinformation. So I'm going to basically focus on what is the role of civil society organization in countering disinformation and what we uh, what uh, organizations can do to tackle this uh, problem. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really excited uh, to have uh, had the opportunity to pull this together with TechSoup. Um, like Peter in the comments just said, this is a very timely topic. Uh, most definitely for Eastern Europe and Central Europe, as we are seeing um, things play out in Ukraine, uh, but also for many countries around the world that are also dealing with mis and disinformation. Um, so with that, I'll kick off our first question um, to the group um, for discussion. How has mis disinformation on the war in Ukraine impacted your community in the Central Eastern region? Maybe for Maria and Tomas, who wants to go first? I, I can start. Uh, so as I already mentioned a little bit, that I would say that the disinformation um, uh, on the war in Ukraine like brought the 
uh, uncertainty, being uh, the situation of being uncertain about what is happening and what will happen in upcoming months. And this is the the context in which uh, like Polish society is in. Um, that it's really fertile ground for this information. We are like we already. I'm, I was tracking like what were the narratives um, uh, pulled like eight weeks ago and right now, and it's really going into the polarization and also the stabilization of the, the support that is already provided to Ukrainian refugees. And so it's really because the situation um, is linked to, to our standard life, our lives about like uh, really housing that is really important, like hard to rent an apartment for us right now, that it's about work, education, that we have Ukrainian children at schools, that it's all like, it's really some unstable situation and we're all in it. And this information, of course, is a great tool to, to destabilize our society even more. Um, so, and what uh, the another impact that I already see is that we have to like the many of the nonprofit organizations have uh, they have to react and transform their core activities to support refugees and that's something that we somehow anticipate that will come closely is that they will be um, uh, targeted by uh, by uh, disinformation uh, and they'll be affected that their work will be somehow um, criticized that they're like they're taking the money that they got that is like not transparent that the system is not helping to those that could that uh, to those who should get the the, um, the help so it's all like really unstable and that's what I see as a kind of something that we need to be prepared and all the strategies that should come within the upcoming months that should be to this to strengthen really uh, to strengthen the resilience of civil society actors it's not only nonprofits it's only these are also activists and journalists I would say and I know Thomas maybe you want to follow on this thanks Maria and I have like very similar findings and I think that the situation here and in Poland are quite uh, alike and yeah I, I I I see and feel that our society has been going through um, I would say a process of uh, increasing anxiety, uh, inner anxiety that is uh, taking its toll in how people are uh, seeing current affairs and how they are willing to be, let's say, uh, willing to be uh, in solidarity with others. But on the other hand, I also see that uh, not only it's the fear and anger that is uh, gripping its way on our society, but it's also uh, the good thing is uh, solidarity and willingness to help others uh, that is uh, blooming, especially in the parts where um, the influx of refugees was the highest, which shows that when people are seen physically, the people in need, uh, that affects them and that turns them to be actually kinder and nicer uh, to the people who... Uh, who, who surround them. And yes, uh, we also are facing problems like there are no longer any places in the kindergarten because uh, there was this influx of children from Ukraine. And yeah, there are plenty of parents who are not uh, happy about the situation, but on the other hand, there is a discussion that uh, we have to overcome this. And uh, this is an objective situation that cannot be really affected that uh, we would wish for uh, new kindergartens to arise over a month because this crisis has started like uh, I would say uh, like a like a sudden thing that uh, was unforeseen and what also changed is that I finally see that society is very very keen on information security and the, the increase on the importance of inf information security happened during the COVID times but now, uh, when more and more people are understanding, for instance, what is a uh, hybrid threat, uh, what is uh, propaganda, how is it affecting the society, uh, I think that our society is more and more uh, prepared to be more resilient towards these techniques. Yet it brings uh, this another uh, characteristic for our society that once we are all aware of the dangers, it became... Uh, more grim to have this existence where we no longer can have these uh, pink glasses expecting that the world will not be threatening to us. So it overly changes how Slovaks are actually seeing the reality. And I would say that this all pre uh, prepares basis for people being more conservative, less liberal. And I think that this will also affect 
like how Slovak society will be moving forward even years after this crisis. Like it affected people and their subconsciousness deeply. Um, just to add a few points to that from, from our, or my perspective, I think um, for us working in health reform in Ukraine, one of the things that was interesting that happened uh, is that um, even pre-war, um, we could see how disinformation could be uh, very, or misinformation, but also like uh, malinformation, the, like you can have ministers or other people being able to um, convey messages incorrectly uh, that are then vulnerable points to shape and change into misinformation. Um, I think the power of information in the social media space and the speed at which it moves is something that we also had to take into consideration in a more systemic way to implement programs successfully on the ground, uh, to build that resiliency that Tomas was talking about, and to kind of uh, have that situational awareness um, so that you can make sure that the initiatives that you're working on are not only uh, doing the most good and reaching the beneficiaries that you want, but also um, are able to withstand shocks from the system. So obviously we are now seeing that with the war in Ukraine as well. Um, so with that, I will uh, move on a little deeper um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what resources, online communities, networks are available to support knowledge sharing and capacity building. Uh, to address disinformation. Um, I'll open it up uh, to the group to, to start discussing uh, what resources, communities, networks you've seen that work. If I may, I would uh, add that in Slovakia, we had this new group called uh, Good. And basically it's a few thousand people who are uh, collectively working on uh, disseminating uh, kindness and messages of solidarity and uh, and basically a, a factual communication. And what they are trying to achieve is that uh, Slovaks are becoming more and more aware how important it is to be part of the discussion in public space, for instance, like on digital platforms. And those people, they organize themselves to come into places where people are not so nice and where there's a lot of hate speech, for instance. And they try to be there to moderate this, the discussion and show the others that um, uh, hateful comments are not normal. The normality is actually on the other side where people are good, where people are kind, where people are uh, understanding each other and they are polite and they are trying to manifest kindness uh, around them. So that was one of the nice stories uh, that uh, emerged uh, even during the COVID, but uh, yes, even during the war, they were like a key factor that helped people in Slovakia understand uh, the, I would say the emotional tone of the situation here. And maybe I, I can uh, add on, uh, on the top of Thomas said, uh, our approach was uh, very much focused on on assumption that uh, in order to fight disinformation, we need agents of change and we need to influence people and change their behavior. So uh, civil society is working on the ground and uh, NGOs are very close to people, especially to vulnerable groups. So our idea was basically to support organizations, build their capacity so they can effectively counter disinformation. And uh, thinking about uh, disinformation, we look through uh, society and we're trying to understand which groups are the most vulnerable. And we were trying basically to, to address programs uh, focus on those groups. And uh, giving you an example, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, those groups differ. So from country to country, the, the problems lay somewhere else. Uh, we can, I think we can easily say that in whole Central and Eastern Europe, the problem is in lack of media literacy. Uh, for children, uh, but also for adults. Uh, so for example, um, elderly people are one of those groups which is really vulnerable to, to disinformation. Um, and our approach uh, late, um, we're trying basically 
to work with all the organizations that are working with people. So we were not focusing on watchdogs, or we're not focusing on, on uh, uh, investigative journalists. We were basically going to those working with children, working with elderly, working with uh, students, um, trying to spread the knowledge about disinformation across society and influence basically uh, people's uh, behavior. And uh, the approach laid in the, in the four um, pillars, one of them was how to understand, like understand, detect disinformation, counter it. Uh, then we had a strong component around building capacity on how you basically educate people, how to use media, how to be a uh, critical thinker, uh, how to basically consume information in the way that it's not affecting you when you are realizing what is the truth, what is false. Um, the third pillar was uh, to basically create positive narratives. Because when it comes to disinformation, one way to go is to fight back, but the other way is to create information which are positive, which are true, which get to the mainstream. And I think when you look at the landscape of Central and Eastern Europe media, uh, you can see that most of media are influenced or owned by uh, our conservative uh, governments. Uh, so there is very little field for, for instance, civil society actors uh, to get to the mainstream. And the last assumption was security and safety. Um, so what we observe uh, in Central and Eastern Europe is there's more and more attacks, uh, basically where targets are civil society organizations or activists. And uh, the war in Ukraine, of course, uh, made this uh, uh, phenomena stronger, not only when it comes to activists uh, from Russia or activists from Ukraine, but also when it comes to basically activists working with refugees in Poland or another uh, neighborhood country. So that was, uh, that was our thinking, like, in order to fight and counter disinformation, you also need to be safe and secured. And this uh, knowledge is, uh, you know, on the very low level amongst activists and amongst civil society, I think, comparably low to the knowledge about uh, disinformation. Maybe a pause now, Marisha, I'll hand it over to you. So maybe you can tell us, sure. give us a bit of practical examples of, of the programs. Yeah, uh, so as Anna said, our approach was to strengthen digital resilience of different actors that have in influence in society. And actually what I think answering also is about your question, what strategies can work here? I think that what we managed to, to do is to create international community of experts and practitioners and educators, because we work with them um, in a big program of uh, media literacy um, to design, to tailor, to localize a different format of education, media literacy um, education, but as Anna said also about um, uh, digital safety and security. Uh, so they could go and um, transfer this knowledge, skills, content in their communities. So, and on, this is like, so we were thinking that trainers, and Tomasz actually is one of our, our uh, great trainers we're working with, uh, that this group is a, a they they can be those agent of change and they can influence the shift of uh, awareness uh, on local level. On the other hand, uh, the same group of international experts they can work together, collaborate, exchange, track some patterns. And it's not only on the media literacy level, but of course, like the core disinformation processes and patterns. Tomasz can tell more about it uh, because those patterns are really replicated in different contexts. Uh, of course, there are country-specific focus and country-specific situation, but it's like we really can learn from each other. It's, it, it's not the point to start everything from the scratch to create media literacy curricula in each country because it's really about the same core critical thinking skills. And that's what this international community of experts can be really a powerful tool um, yeah, to react, to be ready to react. I can pause here, Tomas, if you want to add something here, I can, I can continue later on other um, strategies that we can uh, work on. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to agree, uh, Maria, that uh, disinformation as a phenomena is not only worldwide, it's, uh, as you said, uh, something that is replicating. And uh, we can assume or say that uh, it's basically misusing the same concepts uh, that are incorporated in our brain, that are uh, wired in our brain, uh, even though we live in Asia, Europe, or you know, United States, like uh, in, in most of the cases, the narratives and the techniques of manipulators are the same, and we can learn from each other, like work, uh, what works best, 
but even then uh, we can find like small differences that need uh, I would say a specific approach and specific way and maybe a specific way of tools and uh, techniques how to avoid and, and reason with people who are affected by, by that kind of disinformation or propaganda but in general uh, how we can uh, in maybe global scale save a lot uh, of time and energy and even resources is to actually cooperate learn from each other and build uh, bigger bases of knowledge of information security that has like very universal uh, baseline i would say yeah really great points i think for for from my perspective as well one of the things to remember or at least for me to remember was that um the change agents can also be within your projects. Um, I think have, being, having somebody um, on your project that is susceptible to some of this misinformation when you're trying to implement, like for example, like I was an anti-corruption project in Ukraine, uh, trying to further health system reforms. Um, you know, you need to make sure that your entire team is also, uh, has that critical thinking capability. So for us, uh, the situational awareness and being able to understand what those narratives were that were moving in the social media space in order for us to better target um, our interventions uh, were also really critical. So it will help across the board. I think it, it's something that we need to start thinking about as a community in terms of a skill set that we need to develop for all of our practitioners. It doesn't matter what sector you're working in. Um, because uh, I think, you know, I can give one um, little example from our project. Uh, you know, there's always a lot of hearsay when you're implementing uh, reform projects. You know, they're like, oh, well, my grandmother that lives in this village's friend said that, uh, you know, all the doctors are still collecting all this money. So these reforms are not working. Um, but it's very different when you come to your team and you say like, okay, this is some of the data that we have. There is still a lot of, uh, you know, lack of trust in terms of these reforms because um, these narratives are still prevailing. So what can we do with our counterpart governments, with our counterpart civil society, uh, counterparts, uh, healthcare facilities to help start changing that narrative and also changing behavior around, um, around the these topics. So I think it's also an important point to remember that these strategies can also apply to us and our teams. Um, um, we have some great questions in the chat. Um, we have a question entirely focused on strategies, so we will get those uh, shortly. Um, but with that, maybe I can uh, move us on to the next question. Um, uh, mostly for you, Tomas, uh, how would you describe the complexity of missed disinformation? Um, a zoo, we're, we'll zoom in a little bit into Slovakia right now. Well, firstly, I see it as a structural challenge uh, because um, Slovakia, as many other countries, has been, I would say, taken by surprise by the emergence of new digital platforms. Uh, we never really had a nationwide programs that would help people understand what is the purpose of let's say uh, social media how to use them safely and we were doing all these activities only ad hoc and on a small portion of population even though almost three million Slovaks uh, are, are, are using social media uh, on an everyday basis and that created a symmetry where people are not really ready for the technology that has completely uh, became entwined with their lives and is having a great impact on almost everything they are doing and how they are thinking and how they are informing themselves. And on the other hand, we see that uh, the corporations that have been uh, establishing these uh, services in our country were reluctant to actually uh, show needed amount of responsibility when it comes to providing a better service of that kind. So for instance, we only have one fact checker in Slovakia who is fact checking for 3 million people, which is a, a great amount of asymmetry in uh, uh, securing the interspace. Uh, that created a lot of stress and need for our society to overcome the challenges of information security. And therefore we have like a lot of activists, NGOs, and even the government who in the past two years started to take pace to do something about this uh, uh, problem. And 
In Slovakia, of course, we have another aspect that is cultural. Uh, for instance, uh, the most uh, popular narratives, uh, disinformation narratives uh, that have a high prevalence and high popularity are, for instance, uh, anti-Western and anti-American. And that's not because of objective reasons, but because uh, we as a country have been under uh, constant influence of propaganda since the 30s, uh, when there was the uh, the first, uh, the second world war, uh, and we became uh, a well, a country subjected to uh, Nazi Germany, and then the communism uh, took over, and they've been uh, uh, influencing local population with anti-American propaganda for over fifty years. And then when that ended, even the new generation of Democrats were helping themselves to power by using those narratives, and that is taking place even right now. So the collective unconsciousness of Slovaks has been for three generations um, in, affected by these false narratives and that is greatly affecting how this information are modeled uh, in our uh, particular context. So we have structural challenges, cultural challenges, and then it's a lot of personal challenges as well because it's only few people here in Slovakia who have been studying or uh, getting ready for, for, for all these uh, dangers that have emerged with new technologies. And of course, the other, the, uh, another issue is that there's a lot of lack of resources that would help uh, keep up uh, like a long-term operation of information security in our country, because we only come like from um, seeing the perspective that yes, we are capable of uh, treating symptoms like short-term uh, problems that can emerge from the infosphere, but there is uh, a lack of long-term strategic projects. And I, I just wish this will change in a in a, in a near future. So hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. Um... Okay, let's uh, dive in. We see a lot of lively action in the chat about some strategies. Uh, so what are some tools, strategies that can be used by stakeholders, organizations to mitigate and also make decisions? Um, one of the questions that we received uh, from Peter was about um, how, how can fake news be blocked from entering the digital platforms in the first place? Um, and then also a really interesting question from Mihaela um, about uh, targeting disinformation uh, or how the main targets for disinformation are retired people as were meant as was mentioned a little bit earlier uh, or people over 50 that may also have um, the least uh, digital skills um, but are uh, are you know hanging on to sort of Soviet and communist times and nostalgia um, uh, what are some strategies to reach this segment of the population? So if if I'll hand it back over to the group, um, maybe I can, starting off with, yeah, Maria. I can, I can answer how to um, target the elderly people, which actually in Poland, um, I've learned that it's like rather younger people are more um, susceptible, susceptible to this information. They're like, I was even surprised because it's not, it shows that uh, I've checked several researches and that apparently, um, this is really not with digital skills that um, uh, being uh, the, this uh, risk of being targeted by this information um, goes with. But uh, to answer your question, Hala, I think that what um, the strategy that uh, turned out to be successful in Poland uh, is really like media literacy uh, targeting uh, uh, people over age of 15 uh, or people, retired people, but it has to be done in a safe way and with, uh, with, uh, by the institutions or, or educators who can really be trust uh, among this group and create really a safe environment to learn and to question and also to somehow say, like admit that uh, they are uh, that they they are lacking this knowledge and skills. And if you create this such a and actually one of our trainers that we've been working with in Poland, exactly the, his organization was providing different workshops and uh, webinars for for elderly people, just like being with them and exploring and asking questions and showing how to fact check uh, information they're uh, they're consuming and uh, like the, the evaluation results showed that they really like they started to question uh, and their, their critical thinking skills um, uh, were improved 
so I think that this really, this is a way to do, but that's why librarians, that's why teachers, they're like those people who can be multipliers uh, of uh, media literacy uh, should be targeted and, and tar targeted and actually active with uh, educational tools and resources ready to use like and tailored for um, for this uh, specific age group. I would pause here. And I know maybe Tomas, you could uh, try to answer the question about um, actually the technical solutions that could block. Yeah, um, technically, I think that the most important thing is to understand that uh, the actors who are responsible for disseminating this information, even uh, in the US or in Europe, are often the same. So they are more like uh, recidivists who are conti continuing to do deliberately what, what they were doing in the past. And to analyze that uh, helps us to actually focus like who should be the, uh, for instance, accounts or, or pages that I'm, I'm not saying they should be blocked, but for instance, their freedom of reach might, might be uh, uh, lowered, so they wouldn't be so influential. And with the current state of affairs, for instance, how social media networks work in context of Slovakia, the most popular content, the most uh, engaging content, and most of the interactions come from the accounts that are actually the ones who are mostly responsible for creating this information. So uh, maybe, applying this one rule would change everything. And here in Slovakia, for instance, 80% of interactions created uh, uh, every day are by four clusters of actors who are known to create this information and who are like a very strong and successful proponents of Russian propaganda in our context. And those four clusters contain of uh, approximately 50 profiles and it's mostly politicians so it's very controversial, like how to uh, how to actually uh, decrease their effect on society. But on the other hand, uh, most of them wouldn't even be in politics if it weren't for social media that helped them to actually gain power and become popular. So um, all these, uh, I, th I think technically it's very easy, but before uh, applying these technical solutions, uh, there needs to be uh, like a higher consensus of the society that would be then uh, brave enough to say, okay, it's not enough even for politicians to lie and spread this information. And then we can basically uh, maybe do something about it. But before that, uh, if the consensus is not there, uh, I'm afraid the status quo would, would remain. Uh, Anna, would you like to, to add in anything? Yes, I, th I think that it's, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I think it's, um, I would add one more element, which is lack of uh, independent uh, free media uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. So that is like, a, that has a huge impact. Um, in Poland, according to some researchers, two thirds of population believe uh, in everything they, basically watching television and reading social media. And this is the prime, basically, source of, of people's information. And uh, as I said before, um, public media are owned, like in Hungary and in Poland, by government. So we are facing here, uh, not a foreign disinformation, but we're facing here governmental propaganda, which is just deepening and, uh, and powering up uh, divisions in uh, society. So. Uh, I think that elder is a, is a very good example. I, I don't think that it is as much as nostalgia for the past, but it's rather building a different uh, world, uh, which is based on very conservative values and, uh, and, and which is racist, uh, which is anti-Semitic, which is uh, not basically uh, supporting freedom of uh, people's choice when it comes to who they want to live with or who they want to love. So I think that... Uh, it's a lot of uh, rhetoric against the uh, European Union, against America. Um, so I feel that this is also something that it's really worth to, to recognize that we're not uh, facing here only Russian government creating uh, a huge propaganda machine, but it's being developed in our countries by, by, by our government and uh, people are basically helpless and civil society organization can do as much as they can do, but um, we feel that the polarization is also growing on, on both angles. So it, it's like everybody, people just really start hating each other. 
Um, and it's really hard to work in such communities. So our sense is that there should be more initiatives which are basically building trust in communities. So our approach is really go to local communities, talk to local governments, because this is where you can actually have an influence. Uh, when you really go and under the loop, you see people, you connect them, you make them talk, you make them discuss, you, you start creating a dialogue instead of basically pushing things to, into, you know, uh, extreme um, uh, sides. So I feel that, that these are the, the important things. In, in Central and Eastern Europe, also investigative journalists, they are often working as NGOs. Um, and one of the reason is, you know, the, the difficulty basically in, in operating as a, as a traditional uh, media, but there is also, and I'll just maybe go back to what Thomas already said, and also you, Elizabeth, um, about the connection between sectors, that it's really hard to achieve a critical mass if you don't have different uh, stakeholders at the table. Um, because we need, because the times are difficult, the world is changing very rapidly, it's very dynamic, uh, whatever, like the best example is we've been implementing in Central and Eastern Europe a program in 14 countries focused on countering disinformation funded by the State Department. And it was offline uh, program about educating people on, on how disinformation uh, works and what to do to fight it. And we had only, and then the COVID happened and we had to convert all the offline work into online and we had only three months to do so. And we can lift it because we are, you know, still small, but rather if you look at the whole sector, relatively large organization, but most of organizations can not handle it. So I think that this is also something that is really worth to, uh, to consider that this is extremely dynamic and changing um, environment and without very strong and close collaboration, it will be really hard um, to tackle uh, problems and, and find solutions. And it has to be in between private sector, media, uh, governments, and civil society organizations, but also education institutions. Otherwise, we won't be able really to, uh, to influence uh, people and change behaviors. Thanks. Um, just adding to this discussion, I think, you know, going back to the, the a project implementation perspective um, and zooming uh, up a little bit. I think uh, for, for me as the chief of party of this project, I think being able to use this AI social sensing tool um, was really critical, I think, in order to, to fully understand what we were implementing, kind of like what Anna was saying, um, and, and being able to build uh, this trust in what we were doing. Um, I think just as an example, uh, in Ukraine, uh, one of the big reforms is to roll out a program of medical guarantees for universal health coverage for, for all. Uh, I think we as implementing partners kind of usually go into implementation with a set of assumptions. Our assumption was that, you know, people generally understood what this was about. Um, and so in our implementation, we had partner, one of our uh, stakeholder partners was the National Health Service. So together with them, we uh, worked on a awareness campaign about the program of medical guarantees, you know, posters, um, different types of um, like uh, awareness across different types of communities and sector sector groups uh, to, to spread the word about what the program of medical guarantees was. Uh, when we used the AI social sensing tool, what we came to realize was that um, a lot, there was still a lot of misunderstanding about the program of medical guarantees and what was offered and not offered uh, as part of the package, um, which I think as an anti-corruption project for us is quite interesting because it, that then lends itself to opportunities for informal payments, which we were trying to help the government cut down. Uh, but one of the nuggets of information that our team learned uh, from being able to use this tool and understand the mis disinformation that was uh, percolating around Ukraine uh, was that the largest um, group that we found that didn't understand what the program of medical guarantees was, was the medical community, uh, which we had an assumption was actually like they should know since they're the ones that are uh, in these hospitals with these posters working with us day to day. And so we then were able to quickly shift our approach 
um, by getting this information to not create this void for MISTIS either. So there's a lot of preventative work I think that can be done uh, so that messages are not co-opted uh, because that would have been a very easy vacuum to come in and say like, oh, well, you know, they promised a universal health coverage, but you still have to pay for all these things. Um, and so we then created a very different uh, set of approaches just for the medical community, just for nurses, just for doctors, uh, to understand how the PMG was going to evolve over time. Um, and then that also, like using tools like this, it also helped us be able to monitor a little bit better our impact um, on the project. So just adding another layer of how this can help, because I think, you know, being able to have that awareness up front uh, can really help us across sectors as well and partner with civil society in a, in a more productive way, I think. Um, so as we're rounding out at the time and before we, uh, we move into questions, there's a few questions coming into the chat here. Um, I'll, um, I'll uh, open this up. Um, so first, I think a call to action. So what can people, funders, collaborators do to support some of these strategies? Um, this goes out to the group. And then also looking at our chat, um, you know, what is the tool? Um, I think there's some questions about the tool that we're using for social media sentiment understanding. Um, and, um, you know, any other kind of um, last minute tidbits from, from our discussion panelists here as we're rounding out our time. We have about five minutes. Uh, so with that call to action for the team, uh, discussion groups, and please uh, keep your questions coming. We'll see how many we can answer in the time that we have left. So over to you guys. Mm, I can go first. Ah. Yeah, go. I, I can just say that from the experience we, we, um, we have, we've learned that really creating sustainable systems is super important and supporting uh, mutual visibility of different initiatives that are um, that have the same goals, like to really strengthen the resilience of civil societies, and to to show what actual what strategies, what what tools, what uh, content really works well, and replicate it. Just not to start from the scratch, but really support uh, the mutual exchange and learning. I would say that this is like call to action. That's like yes, help us to do this better and help us to keep going. Tomasz, over to you. Yeah, uh, I, I see it very similarly, and I think that it's time to uh, adopt the philosophy that we are all kind of uh, physical citizens of our world and our communities, but also active digital citizens uh, in that digital realm where we have like our own uh, way or potential of power to actually uh, influence that little bit of society that we live in. And I think it's better when people would actually accept that they would have like more fulfilled lives and would live in more safer and better working societies when they would be more active uh, also on the platforms in a, in a good way, in a positive and meaningful way and be less passive because being passive on social media, it's like ending up in a trap where you would become maybe even more hopeless and desperate. So it's always better to be active. It's always better to do something. And of course, connect with, uh, with other people and look for the ways how to make all these activities something that is gonna be a long-term activity. Like it's not gonna be something that I will be doing only over a season, but it can become like a, my hobby or, or something that I do as a volunteer on a, on a long-term basis and maybe even find a way to build a career around uh, such activity. Like, uh, that was basically the, the, the story of my uh, involvement in this that I started as a person who was just volunteering and eventually became, uh, well, uh, a professional in, in what I'm doing. So, Anna, over to you. Um, I think I would still support the idea of. Uh, Mm, building bridges, building connections, and building trust in communities. So, but what what Thomas uh, was actually also saying, I I believe that sustainability, which Marisa was referring to, is super important. Um, but it's very hard at this point. It's very hard to achieve that because the situation is so dynamic. So the war is a huge game changer, and uh, I think that this information has to be always. Um, 
approach having the political background in the in the back of a hat. I I do have unfortunately pessimistic view that the the, the, the war in Ukraine will uh, not help democracy in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, meaning that it will rather um, help to centralize power and uh, build specific narratives around that. Uh, and it will be an instrument in the, in the hands of uh, people who are governing um, Poland, Hungary, and, and other uh, places. But I feel that this uh, ability really to address it on multiple levels and looking uh, into it from different perspectives is, is, is super uh, important, having in mind uh, that the, the society we live in is polarized and that the internet is uh, just deepening this polarization. Um, and I think that the local level in terms of when you look at what can be done uh, and in Ukraine actually for war it was a bit the same like it was you could achieve way more locking locally working locally than than working on the on the national level so I'm always reluctant to think strategy because you can have to your strategy and then something like war or COVID happens and the strategy is gone. So I think that flexibility, thinking in the in the way of you know having a, even a strategy if things are changing rapidly is something um, definitely worth to consider and and building those connections across uh, sectors and supporting civil society in building uh, those connections with local activists uh, and with local organizations. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I think just to close it off, uh, the call to action, I think, from my side is really pushing um, our donors um, and other contributors uh, to, to start looking at myths and disinformation as a, a very necessary cross-cutting aspect of the work that we do across all sectors. Um, like we've all highlighted, it isn't uh, just a, you know, one um, function of work that we have to do. I think it's a way that we have to uh, start rethinking how we do international development and integrating some of this larger situational awareness and impacts and ramifications into our programming. Um, tying back to what Administrator Power said, Yesterday in the kickoff, it, you know, a more ecosystem approach to using digital tools. Um, and as Tomasz said earlier, we are digital citizens now in a very digital world. Uh, so it's very important, I think, for us to start developing these skills within our organizations as well as with our beneficiaries. Um, and really rethinking how we're approaching some of the problems we're trying to help solve. Um, so I think uh, with that, a, a great conversation from all of us, I think really timely opportunity for us to bring up this topic. Um, um, you know, I agree with Anna, having spent many years in the region as well, unfortunately, uh, and, uh, and maybe fortunately, while the war in Ukraine has brought this topic of myths and disinformation to the forefront for us, um, it isn't uh, going to just end. I think it will uh, continue to evolve and get more sophisticated. Um, and I think the onus is on us uh, to make sure that we can keep up and get ahead of it uh, by being able to build these critical thinking skills. Uh, I think this is a global problem, uh, obviously not just affecting Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I think we see it in the news everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, social media is not going anywhere. So something that we will need to develop uh, from the school level, like, uh, like Maria was talking about early on, and in terms of media literacy um, uh, across all types of groups, uh, but in particular with vulnerable groups. And I think, you know, a misconception for us is always that it's digitally linked, uh, but it isn't uh, always so. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for the chat and uh, for the questions that came uh, for TechSoup uh, for helping uh, us pull this together as well, and uh, to obviously our uh, participants today. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day enjoying the rest of GDDF, and please uh, do not hesitate to get in touch with any of us um, on hearing more about the work that, uh, that we're all doing um, in this very important space. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.